Um, good afternoon, Merlin. Um, I'm John Saunders. I'm the CEO of, uh, of Pasifino Gold. Um, and I have with me my colleague, Daniel Limpetlaw, Dr. Daniel Limpetlaw, who's our project manager, mining engineer, and he's also a, an environmental uh, scientist. Um, and, and just to give you a, a slight feel or a slight flavor of where we are, um, we, we run a, an exploration and development play in southern Liberia. Uh, we're in the feasibility study stage and we're about to complete that. Um, and we, it looks like end of April, we will be complete and delivering to, the, uh, to our investors and to the public uh, in, in, in the wider domain, the results of that feasibility study. John, thanks for the introduction. Daniel, good to have you on the call as well. Um, <clears throat> now, I first came across the, the Doobie Gold project back in the, the uh, 2012, 2013. And I remember very clearly you know, as the money was come pouring out of the junior sector and values were coming right down. I remember it was a dreadful occasion in probably December 2013. It was, the, I think it was Minds and Money in London. And I was chatting to Dan Betts and I had about three or four companies come in with these projects that were just stranded and no one cared in that environment. And it was just, I, I just felt so bad for these CEOs who were just kind of looking gutted mm -hmm. And Dan eventually found um, Jan Falila in Mali and went off and did that. But, you know, what was your route? And I haven't heard much about Doobie um, ever since then. Um, but I just wonder what, your, what, your, what was your route into the company and kind of how did you come, come to it? Well, it, primarily through Ian Stalker, our CEO, who both myself and Daniel have a, a long relationship with. And we sort of form a bit of a core technical team that works on various projects for him. Um, and he, he got hold of me a couple of years ago and said, you know, we, there's a potential to invest and uh, potentially uh, develop this um, ore body that's sitting there in Liberia, which was Dugby on Tucson um, and Dugby F, the two deposits. Um, and we looked at the data briefly and myself and the VP exploration uh, decided to, to, that we would like to go forward with it. And we, and we were asked as your due diligence. And of course, we did that, came back with a motivation, a strong motivation to, to invest in the in the project, um, as I said, that was two years ago. And, um, you know, we were surprised that there was this sort of deposit sitting under the radar, basically nearly 4 million ounces in open pitable resource um, that, that required a fair amount of work to, to, to update the, the technical work that had been done and update the MRE. Um, and we started that in September, 2020, and we find ourselves at, at completion, almost of the feasibility study now in the next couple of months. I, um, so I, I, that's, that's how we got into it. I always um, thought of it as kind of a, a this kind of very low grade deposit, mm. um, but I, I think perhaps that was just the kind of the, the time and the context. But you know, you know, when I look at it now, it's actually not that low grade. Um, it's yeah. it's it's was true. So um, remind me, it's it, it's. Um, so the, the, run me through the numbers. Okay, so we got at the moment we've got three point three million ounces are measured and indicated, of which uh, there is a, a high grade portion, at, 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 and that's at about one point three four grams a ton, um, and we've got a high high grade portion, um, which equates to about five years life of mine at one point five eight grams a ton, um, you know probably around about one hundred and seventy one hundred and eighty thousand ounces a year production rate, um, so. You know, from a from a resort, and, and and the other thing, and it's interesting you say low grade. Look, it's relatively low grade, but not like a lot of the others of our peers that are out there sitting at the point zero point eight point nine. Yeah. Um, and, and and one one really cool thing for us is that the grade is consistent. Um, it's fine grained. Uh, it's not. It's got a very low nuggety nature. So it you know from a continuity point of view, you know it's really good. It's like it, it's it's unusual that it's not a. Uh, a Beremian style shear zone hosted deposit. Um, although it sits, we think, in the Beremian, it's a, it's a, it's a high, high grade metamorphosed, uh, nice, nice environment. Um, but, but nevertheless, um, you know, we've modeled it to, to a point of very high confidence. And, you know, when we're able to now go and, 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 and schedule that and put that into, a, into the DFS. So it's, and it's, it's yeah. Go ahead. So just, just kind of describe it, kind of the, 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 the geometry of it and how it lies. And um, remind me of the mineralogy and the, you know, um, the host rock. Is, is it hard and silicious? You know, yeah. you know what, what, 
Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about the characteristics of the deposit, please. Well, there, there, in brief, there are two deposits. You've got the Dugbief deposit um, and the Tucson deposit. They're four kilometres apart. Um, and obviously, it has the benefits for, for infrastructure, et cetera. Um, the Dug deposit is a, is a shallow dip, dipping um, sheet of, um, of mineralized orthopyroxene, pyroxene nisus. And it's, uh, it's about anything from three to 10 meters thick, very gently dipping. Um, whereas the Tucson deposit is, 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 a, is a basically a full deposit. There are, it goes to F3, so there are three phases of, of deformation. Um, and and the, the, the actual geometry of that is that it, it, it goes to a depth of about 350 meters to the nose of the fold, the, the F3 fold. And it's basically sitting, um, striking north, 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 east, south, southwest, um, with the hinge, the final hinge sitting in the subvertical. So you have the two, the two limbs of the, of the ore body um, running up sort of in, in that sort of fashion. Um, yeah. So it, it's and and it, so basically, the, the, as I say, the one is is fairly low, sort of a, a gentle dip, um, and the other one is 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 quite quite folded. Um, but and, but as a result, is you know allows the pit to, footprint to be a lot smaller than it would have been otherwise. And the oh, lots of questions. So the 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 just sticking on um, Dugby initially, you say um, orthopyroxene um, pyroxene nicer, so kind of dark rocks is it do you have a um a visual handle on what is mineralized and what isn't you know you said three to ten meters can you see when you're outside or inside the the, the mineral zone it, you know what, what's going to be looking yeah, ha, has, what's grade control going to be like when you get into it yeah uh, great grade control um once you get your iron should be fine um the 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 foot wall is has is Gonitiferous, so it's it's you you can you can you know when you've got into the foot wall. Yeah. Um, the, the hanging wall is is a little bit more bl- a little bit more bland, um, but you can actually you can see the top contact of of these. In fact, you can see the contacts of of both of them when you get into when you when you actually get your iron. So you know that's been quite a debate with a um, with the technical team and our consultants as to what sort of grade control will will require. Um, and where and how much dilution we're going to get as a result of of, of that? Is it, is it a is it a clear um, kind of uh, lithographic or kind of a, a lithological difference, or is it just kind of a bleed out of the grade? Is it gradual? Um, it, it, you know, it, it fade is slightly of grade. Trans, it's slightly transitional, um, but not not to any great extent. But you know yeah. these these types of rocks. I mean, it's, it's got a very very high its hardness index. It's very hard. Um, and it is a little bit difficult um, in core to, if you haven't got your iron, to know where the bottom and top con- contacts are. Yeah. Um, the, the other sort of main feature of the, of the, of the all body, both all bodies, um, is that we, we do have uh, in, you know, intrusives that, are, that come through, um, but those have, those have been modeled out. Um, so you know, then those are obviously have very, very sharp contacts. Post mineralization, post mineral, yeah. post, post, post mineralization and sterile. Yeah. Do they um, remobilize any? Um, no, 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 no noticeable no, remobilization. Not of- that we can see. You know, the actual deportment of the gold is is relatively fine grained. Yeah. Um, but they 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 post date. You know, I'm not sure. We're not 100 percent sure of the timing, but they post date the um, the the actual ore body quite significantly, and the um, the contacts are very sharp. They're, they're pegmatitic, basically, and, and, and very easy to, 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 to model. So, you know, we've been fortunate that we can model most of it out uh, for the MRE. And Dubi described as kind of a very gently dipping um, yeah. feature or um, deposit. Is Tucson also hard? And is it also in orthopyroxenes? Yes. yes. So we, we, we it, it, it basically, it's the, from a structural perspective, if you... Um, we, we believe that it's basically the same horizon, but they're four kilometers apart on the on, on the western side where you have Dugby. Um, it, it relatively flat lying, but when you move east, you go into a granite, a granite. So it's a, but it's a it's a post depositional granite, um, quite late. Um, we can see it on the on the mag, um, and it, it it when once you get to the eastern side of that, then you get the more fault, a lot of more folding. 
The other, the other feature that, that influences the, the geometry of the ore bodies is to the south, just to the south of um, both of these deposits, we have the Dugby shear zone. So it's a regional shear zone. And um, when you actually look at where the mineralization is sitting, it's sitting on typically like you, you probably know in, in, in Ghana and places you, where these shears come off the, or anywhere in West African Beremian. Second order structures. Off, yeah, you're coming off the main um, shear zone and, and you, on the jogs and on, on those features, you get mineralization. So there is a bit of a visual correlation for that. Um, but yes, basically exactly the same um, uh, rock type. Um, and the grade's fairly similar. Um, so, and, and the recovery's almost exactly the same in terms of MET. And uh, uh, once, once, structurally, once much more structurally um, deformed than correct. the other ones, folded and, um, yes. and the other is, is, is flat lying. Yes, correct. Interesting. And um, the hardness, is that a post-mineralization kind of silicification event, or is it the, the primary um, um, I think it's, no, we think crystalline it's, structure yeah, of the it's, rock? We think it's post. It's very difficult. I mean, the original fabric's been obliterated, so it's very difficult to tell what, what that was. But it's certainly a ductile environment. Uh, it's yeah. not brittle sharing or, of, of any sort. Right. Um, so it's, it, it, you know, most def- and, and that's probably fortuitous in that we don't have large displacements from brittle structures running through the, the deposits. In fact, what's quite interesting, we discovered um, when we took the project over and we're doing the infill drilling to, to convert to, to indicate it um, in the southern portion of, of uh, Dugby F, which, I'm, as I said to you, is a, a relatively flat-lying, slightly dipping ore body. Um, we, came, we actually drilled a, a recumbent fold in the southern area of that, about 800 meters strike, 900 meters strike, 40, 50 meters wide, which we were quite pleased about because one, it would reduce the strip a little bit and two, it duplicated the ore body. So, it, 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 you know, I'm not, it's strictly speaking, you know, it depends where you are, but in general, the domain, that structural domain for DUGBF is relatively gentle, flat lying and not being disturbed too much. Uh, the, the other, I think, sort of obvious difference between the two is that two's on, is just a little bit, the grades are a little bit higher there um, on average. So, you know, obviously this, I think this, the, the folding has had, had an impact on that. Um, and we, we have concentration of mineralization, um, you know, in, in the fold nose. Um, and if, if we get a chance at some point, I could show you a, 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 a 3D model uh, of, of where that, that mineralization is sitting and you know, where the extensions, because both of these, all bodies are open at, at um, on strike or uh, on the periphery, so um, you know there is there is opportunity for expanding once the mine is in operation and and, and they, they need to look for more material. But at the moment, we've got fourteen years life of mine, so that probably won't happen anytime soon. And when you talk about those first five years at slightly higher grades, is that yeah. a blended um, a blended feed from both pits? Well, we in in there, there is a higher grade zone in both of them. Um, what we didn't do was model a high grade zone for the, the feasibility study. But for instance, at Tucson, there is a central core area, um, which, is, which is higher grade. Um, but the, and, and I said, the average, the average grade there is about 1.58, 1.6 grams a ton. Yep. And, and, but when you look at the average grade overall, it's in the mid, mid 1.35s. Um, and the intention there is to, um, is to, take out the higher grade zone by, and, and not just by high grading it, but by scheduling it correctly uh, and taking the lower grade stuff. So anything from 0.5 to one gram a ton, because that's at one gram a ton cutoff and stockpiling that um, and bringing that lower grade material into the, into the um, back end of mind, the life of mine. At the yeah. back, of, back end. And we, we're busy. I'm, you know, Daniel, jump in whenever you'd like to. Um, he's, he's, he's also deeply involved in this, um, but that, that, that allows us a sort of average grade of around about 1.4, 1.5 grams a ton for the first uh, four, four odd years. Uh, the trick at the moment is to, um, and we're busy with the scheduling, is to settle on whether we mine both pits at the same time or whether we mine do twos on, on its own first. Um, they obviously have pluses and minuses. If we do that for twos on only, then we, you know, upfront capital on on haulage roads and and potentially some of the fleet and so on is 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 lower. Um, 
so you know we're we're very very close to making that decision. Um, and now, we are not, managing our, our strip ratio by mining, mining, uh, mining both of them simultaneously. Yeah. So that, that's the trade off. Yeah. Um, and what's um, what's it? Sorry. So I was going to, so I was going to ask that, is that you've gone straight from PEA to feasibility study. Yeah. Now, normally, yeah. what happens is in the in the in the pre feasibility stage, lots of these. Um, um, trade off studies are, are done, and I know that trade off studies continue right through, and you're always optimizing until the thing closes. Yeah. But <clears throat> the, the, normally, the, the time when you do the most amount of trade off studies is in, in is in your PFS stage, so that you can actually then work out what yeah. is the best version that you're going to do the detailed engineering on. Well, so I, I wondered if you comment on kind of that that thought yeah. process and, and how those different things. Uh, well, maybe I um, could I can I can just sort of lead a little bit, and I'm sure Daniel will be able to contribute more than I can. But just historically, um, Hummingbird did a high quality, um, you know, high quality piece of work in terms of environmental the ESIA, and they were they were going to they were in, in currently in a PFS phase. So we were. That was one of the cool things about the project. Was there's a lot of this data sitting there already. Um, so that allowed us to negate the need for, you know, as much trade-offs as you would do. But you're right. We've been doing a lot of trade-off work, even so. Um, yeah, we had, and, we had a partial yeah. FS when when we started yeah. this project. So we had yeah. a partial FS before we did a PEA, which is a little unusual, uh, and it's one of the reasons why we didn't elect to go for a PFS. Um, the other thing is that as the the MREs have been been firmed up. Uh, we've been able to do more and more detailed scheduling and bit optimization. So some of these things we would be doing at this stage in any event, even if we did have a PFS, because we simply wouldn't have had the geological resolution, uh, you know, a year or two ago. Okay. And um, you completed your, your mineral resource estimates. Uh, that was done last year, wasn't it? And so you're, you're yeah. able now to do the detailed scheduling uh, on the back Correct. of that MRE work. That's right. So we did two updates of MRE. We, we updated the historical MRE earlier um, in the year and then in, I think it was November, we delivered the, the converted. So we converted, you know, a large percentage, 90% odd um, of inferred into, into indicated um, on, on both, both deposits and delivered that late last year to Daniel's team who, you know, have been working with it ever since. Great. And so you're quite close now to finishing your, your feasibility study. I mean, you're, yeah. you're months away. Possibly weeks yeah, well, away. Well, the target date for um, announcing the outputs or of, of in the economics um, is the end of April. Um, we're really working hard to to meet that deadline. Hopefully, not, not we don't have any slippage. If we do, well, we do, but that's the the target. Um, so yeah, we're 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 what 12, 14 weeks or something away from that. Um, and then we'll obviously we'll submit on CDAR within forty five days after that. So it's it's. You know, it's really all hands on deck now. Although it's not as if it hadn't hadn't been. We just a little bit of history. Um, we we had to we had to rehabilitate seventy kilometers of road uh, before we got in there in, in one of the highest rainfall environments in in, in Africa. Um, and we we put twenty four bridges in. We got in there, uh, got in done, got the exploration done, and then Daniel's uh, consultancy teams got in there and. You know, and it's sort of the way we work. We, we we've done this in the past, where we've gone for almost zero to 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 sort of build in, in this sort of time frame. And I think that's really a lot of that's due to the fact that we all know each other and we understand what our capabilities are, um, and we're able to push each other as, as, as hard as we've done. You see, Daniel's just looking a little bit grayer and a little bit older now, but um, after this two-year period, <laughs> twenty-four yeah, so bridges, did you say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's been a good life. Yeah, I'm only I'm only 24. Um, good. Do you say 24 bridges you had to put in? We yeah, we 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 had to re rebuild the road and put 24 log bridges in. And in, in fact, it, it's the the site is 70 kilometers from a serviceable port called Greenville, um, which is to the we're to the east of that. Um, and that road will be upgraded for operational and and build reasons um, as part of the a part of the build phase. So we're extremely lucky that we have a, an operational port which basically um, has a 50% ut utilization that, that's at our doorstep. So a lot of the um, savings on logistics, um, et cetera, have, have come from that. I mean, we're not sitting in Guinea, um, you know, 800 kilometers away from the coast. 
Um, so, you know, cost per, per ton kilometer is, 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 is really good. And remind me, what's the state of mining in um, Liberia? Who's, who's, who's active there at the moment? Well, you've got uh, the large iron ore mines uh, owned by ArcelorMittal. Um, Are they operating? Yeah, they're operating, yeah, and they have been for a long time. And then you have MNG, which is New Liberty Gold, um, which is, uh, Daniel's had some involvement there. Uh, you know, they've been going for, I think, something like 10 years. But they, so there is a culture, a, a mining culture in the country, albeit relatively small. Um, but luckily, we have, you know, a small population and, and, and a, very, a government that's very keen to support us. And, you know, if we get some time, we could talk about our mineral development agreement, which is a, a document that's de-risked the project significantly. So, um, yeah. Well, um, to say it now. You know, what, what is that mineral okay. development agreement? Well, what, what, Hummingbird, um, before we arrived uh, in two, 2019, signed a mineral development agreement, which is a little bit sort of more advanced than you would expect in, the, in most West African countries. Um, and what it does is it encompasses a whole plethora of, of, of items that you would expect to have to negotiate with the government post the end of the exploration phase. And, and once you've submitted your mineral resource estimate um, and your feasibility study in ESIA, and it, it, it includes um, a, a financial stability period of uh, 15 years. It's got a good, good tax rates, 35% uh, tax rate. We have 3% royalty. Um, there's a 10% free carry, just like anywhere else in Africa. But we yep. have really good tax breaks on, on duties for things like oil, fuels, et cetera. Um, and, 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 and basically what it, it really is, is, a, is it, it's a, a continuum into the, the feasibility application and the fact that they, they, you know, makes that a hell of a lot easier. So, you know, a lot of that, all the negotiations in terms of, of what you would normally have to go through when you submit the feasibility study is or not there. Um, so it, it, it's de-risked the project significantly. The, the CapEx uh, in the PEA was 285 million. Is, is, is that right? Sorry. No, no, no. I've, um, remind, me, remind me what the CapEx was in, in, um, in, the, in the PEA. Sorry, I'm getting my companies confused. Well, the, the, the CapEx is just, just over 400. Just over 400. And are you seeing inflation? I mean, because you're, you know, you're right at the sharp pointy end of a um, of the feasibility study, and you know, inflation is in all of the numbers, it's in all of the headlines at the moment. And there have been a couple of kind of quite punchy capital cost blowouts in development um, projects worldwide in the mining space. Just wondered how you're kind of accommodating and dealing with that historic figure of the capex and what you're looking at going forward. Yeah, look, you're quite right. I mean, we're, we're in the, the sort of coming out of the, the tail end of the COVID pandemic, which has done terrible things to, to prices uh, and shipping and uh, fuels and reagents and all those things. Um, so we have a bit of a challenge at the moment when it comes to, to getting these numbers right. We, we believe that uh, in, the, in the, the, the horizon that we have to, towards the, the build of the project, we're going to see some sort of normalization. Um, and what we're trying to do is to make sure that we put realistic numbers into our financial model. There, there definitely yep. has been some inflation. Um, and we are currently working on, uh, on how, we're going to, how we're going to accommodate that, um, especially uh, you know, more in the OPEX than in the CAPEX, but, but it's definitely something that we're dealing with. In, in the OPEX, in terms of fuel and labor and Food. I mean, what, what, what are they? What are the reagents, key inputs? Fuel and reagents. Fuel and I reagents. Think seeing some inflation in, in those numbers, but the you know last year and towards the end of last year they spiked quite dramatically. There's some evidence that they're coming back to more reasonable levels, um, and and we just have to make sure that we reflect those correctly in our models. Well, of course, the gold price goes with it. So you 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 know the, the costs go up, but so do your revenues. But um, it, it doesn't change your margin. Let's put it that way. Um, and that, I guess the devil is in the detail there. Absolutely. But the, the gold price is also affected by things that don't necessarily come down. I mean, there's a, you know, sort of geopolitical tensions in Europe and other places that, that influence the gold price too. Maybe I could just um, add, there have been some, 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 some you know, good, good reductions in some of the inputs from an OPEX point of view. 
Um, I think Daniel and his team were looking at, at diesel gen sets at one time. Um, and and, and you know, I'll let you go ahead, Daniel, but we've reduced our, we're reducing our um, cost per kilowatt, kilowatt hour quite significantly. Um, we've gone to LNG, an LNG um, mix of with solar. Um, so that that that's made a significant impact uh, on the on the cost of energy. Yeah, one um, of the, the nice things about these days with the, the technology cost curve of renewables is that in the, you know ten years ago, if you wanted renewables on site, you had to have a very strong green argument for it, and you had to have uh, uh, ESG reasons for doing it. And now, it, not only do you have all of those, but often it's cheaper. So it actually yeah. reduces your levelized cost of energy. And have you find have you finalized your process flow sheet yet? Are you still considering doing flotation or or just kind of um whole or leach? Uh, that is the uh, four hundred million dollar question at the moment. We have uh, two very competitive uh, process flow sheets. Uh, one slightly more complex but with better recoveries, and one simpler but with slightly reduced recoveries. And we are doing our final optimization tests this, this month. So I guess in about two weeks' time, we will have the, have the answer on the table. Right, internally. And it'll come out. I mean, will you announce that or will, you put, will that be kind of an end product or the feasibility study? We'll probably put an interim, interim press release out uh, if we nail it down you know, soon enough, if it drifts into the, into the, uh, the, the feasibility study announcement then we'll we'll leave it till then but if we can we will announce earlier we, we put out a um an update to a, a few weeks back um and we we should really put one out and we probably will do uh, as long as we can get get this button down fairly soon and john I, i've got to ask because it kind of, it's kind of the elephant in the room you know the project seems to stack up technically and you know it's got a um it's it's got scale and longevity and yet your market yeah. cap is so small yeah um you know, what do you talk about internally? You know, it, it, what, what are your discussions with Ian about? You know, is, is there a sense of frustration or do you feel that you've just got to go through the steps and get the news out there and it'll, and it'll happen, it'll come with time? Look, I think there's a couple of answers to that. Um, you know, it, 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 there's no churning of the stock, really, you know, from my perspective. Um, but we, we don't really focus on that too much. Um, if you look at our peers, and, and Daniel's an avid tracker of our peers when it comes to their share price performance, and we have four, four of those, uh, we won't name them, and three of them are pretty much tracking in exactly the same way that we are. So it's, a, it's an We're affliction that's not, uh, not limited to ourselves. Um, but um, we are seeing, seeing an uptick now. Um, and I think the – and we have had interest in the company, as you probably know, um, Esan, um, who are a very large Turkish mining outfit, they have a one and a half billion dollar turnover a year. Have have taken just under twenty percent of the company, and one of them is my one of my fellow board members now. So, and we have had interest elsewhere. So, um, it's it's you know there are there are two strings to our bow in this particular case. Um, one is the the interest that we're getting from that type of of company, but we think also that the once the feasibility study is out. We know it's going to be solid, and uh, and 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 uh, and investors etc. see that, and then I think you'll see a certain change in, in the in the share price, and the cap market the market cap should go up significantly. And um, the New Liberty is being run by a Turkish company, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, and it's not Esan; it's a, it's a different entity. That's Av- Av- is that correct? Um, uh, yeah, Avatora. Avatora is the was the kind yeah. of the holding company, but behind it yeah. there's a, um, it's a Turkish Turkish, uh, Turkish um, owned. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. But unrelated to Esan, who's who's totally, into you. Yeah, no, the, totally unrelated. Interesting. Great. Um, is there anything else that you that you want to kind of communicate that I haven't asked about? I think just you know, not not necessarily, but you know, we just want to re-emphasize that we're at a, at the point where we're about to deliver a really strong, robust feasibility study, um, and we, we're we're confident that we'll deliver it on time. We think that the the economics are going to be really, really firm and strong. So otherwise, I think, you know, we've probably covered most of the, the, the technical areas that we need to. Um, and we're just, we're in, as I said, we're about to complete. And, you know, soon we'll be in a position to announce those, those numbers. So, um, I, I meant to ask, but I forgot to get down the, the, the rabbit hole of, of all hardness and grind size and um, yeah. liberation yeah. And, 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 and all of that kind of stuff. I started just kind of this, this whole mineral processing side, which I've just kind of failed to ask about. Can you 
talk about that, you know, grind size, liberation, separation. Um, and I guess that kind of speaks to whether you're going to do the whole or leech or the, um, the flotation and is the mineralogy consistent and how does the gold comport and, um, you know, are, are there any refractory elements to the sulfides? Well, I think I'll let Daniel handle that, but it's an acute observation. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, maybe one question at a time would be easier. Uh, I can tell you that the ore is hard. We, we, have to, we have to throw the book at it in terms of, of milling. So we get the benefit in, in the pit slopes. Our inter-ramp angles are very nice. The, the, uh, the, it's, a, it's a great rock to mine fr from, a, from a slope stability perspective. But when it comes to milling it, uh, you need quite a bit of effort. So, you know, we have we have a fair amount of power that we have to throw at it. Um, our, our flow sheets uh, are either going to be at a, a 75 micron uh, mill or a, a 53, depending which one we go for. So the 53 has a, um, a vertimal uh, in behind a, a sag mill and a ball mill. Um, uh, the, but then it's a straight CIL. The what's the, the sorry? What's the what's the bond work index of of the rock roughly? I'm afraid I don't have uh, the number. But but it's I mean, it's 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 high. It's kind of 15, 16, yes. 17. Yeah. Yes, no, it's high. It's, it's, it's up there. It's, 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 and abrasive. I don't think it's particularly abrasive. Uh, again, I don't I don't have the. I, I apologise for not having the data to hand. I was no no. Level no, sorry, sorry. No, I was, <laughs> didn't mean to put it on the spot, but you know, I just 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 um it. Yeah, um, it's just kind of um, you know these are things that you um, have to deal with. In, in you know, yeah, um, let me put it this way: that we're not we're not designing our circuits for highly abrasive ore. Um, yeah. We are we are concerned about the the um, comminution energy that's required. So it's it's not a soft ore by any means. Um, yeah. but in some ways, that helps us in the in the, in the processing circuits. Uh, and and the mineralogy is relatively consistent. We don't see um, uh, significant refractory uh, components. So uh, the the challenge for us is to is to is to to ensure that we get a, a fine enough grind, um, and then to make sure that that we can deal with the the various um, uh, species. So in, in the in the one uh, the one circuit we have um, an intense an intensive uh, leach component, which we are still. We're still going through the optimization tests to confirm. Is it um, pyrite or is there uh, there's a um, beryllium arsenopyrite through it as well? There are a number of Arsenian species, uh, so it's not uh, there's not just just one, but there, there's a bit of uh, marcasite and little yeah, a little bit of maldonite pyrite. Right. You know, the, the sort of sweet you'd expect in 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 the beryllium. You know. Uh, yeah. Nothing, nothing yeah. different. Yeah. Um, but not particularly refractory and as um, Daniel says, which is a bit of a relief. Um, but we are continuing with the test work just to see, you know, what the what the mineralogy of that is, and it, it, you know, what is the the actual contained gold in that, and is it worth trying to free or not? Yeah. Um, hence the intensive sardination um, section of the of the flow sheet. But it, it, again, we're we're on the cusp of making that decision in, in terms of which way we go, and then. You know that will obviously impact on. It allows us. To, it releases us to get the the, the study completed, um, and allows us to start working really hard on on what the economics will look like because obviously they're slightly different for the two. It would have a higher capex, but a better recovery. Yeah. So higher capex, higher higher recovery, on the one side, and uh, actually we we have a the although the one circuit is 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 uh, simpler, it has a it has vertimal. So it has a, more of a comminution uh, component up front. So that also elevates the the capex. But you know, es essentially, we we are still in the process of deciding exactly which way we're going to go. Right. But just Sorry, to, so, just so, so. I can say quickly, just in terms of capex, um, we're you're obviously optimizing all the other areas of infrastructure um, to make sure that we stay as close to the PEA number as we can, and we're, we're making some good progress on on that front as well. Good. Well, I look forward to uh, uh, getting the interim uh, news flow, but the the the, the biggie will be the uh, feasibility study, uh, the feasibility study at the end of April or um, to public in May. Correct. Great. Well, um, gents, thank you so much. Um, I know much more about the project now than I did at the start of the the call, um, which I guess is the point. Yeah. No, it's been a pleasure chatting to you, man. Thank you, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you.